So it's my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Maxim Karia. He's the CTO of X-Wing. And today's talk title is X-Wing. The journey to deploying autonomous cargo aircraft. So, Mr. Garial, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and thank you, uh, Eric, for, for having me, and thank you to your all the organizing committee. So I'm going to be talking today about X-Wing and the journey to deploying autonomous aircraft, uh, similar to what we had last year with uh, a bit more details. And we're going to start with a short movie to uh, show you a bit about the, the company. X-Wing Caravan Conquer, ground runway one, left taxi via golf. Three, two, one. Autonomous flight technology pioneer x is looking to take a leap forward. A technology that could transform the business of flight in every part of the country. Making aviation history with its demonstration of the first autonomous gate-to-gate -gate flight with a commercial cargo aircraft. The company hopes to begin commercial freight operations in 2022. Back from a fully autonomous flight with X-Wing, it felt like a normal flight. It wasn't scary at all. In our approach in the X-Wing plane, the computer kept us on a perfect glide path to the runway. It's a one-click solution. You select an airport, pick the appropriate runway, build a flight plan and a directory to get there, and execute that. It could be the beginning of a new industry that makes affordable deliveries to small, overlooked airports all over the country. Suddenly, thousands of small U.S. airports could be shipping hubs. Before we uh, dive into uh, more of the details, I want just to give you some introduction about myself and how, uh, how we got there. So I started uh, with a background in aerospace engineering and that I did an internship where I was doing Autolens and that's where like my passion for robotics and making a flight by themselves like, came together. Then I got the opportunity to meet with uh, Eric and that's actually, uh, Eric has been like a, a string in my life to, uh, to, to take me to, to X-Wing. So thank you, Eric, for all of this. And uh, I think if uh, you're all here, and you have him in your life, uh, be thankful, and I think it will lead you all to, to great things. So my PhD in aerospace engineering was focusing on um, air traffic management. So that gave me then the, uh, the idea of like, not the idea, but understanding of what it takes to not just fly aircraft, but to organize all the aircraft. And when things start failing, how do you make sure that you have a backup plan? A lot of times as a uh, controls engineer, we, we try to optimize things, but we don't always think about what do we do when things go wrong. And in aviation, it's mostly about when things go wrong. We cannot afford to have failures. Uh, so the plan B, the plan C, the plan D are as much important, even more important than the plan A. Then did some uh, a postdoc and uh, then went to Rockwell Collins to work on uh, this helicopter on the top left where we had a triplex flight control system. And then again, I was in charge of safety and redundancy, looking at what it means when you have a flight control system to be redundant and to be fail safe. And uh, joined next week in 2016 when we opened the, the office. So X-Wing is building uh, what we call like a software-defined middle-mile air transportation network. So it's not just the aircraft. It's how do you have the aircraft as well as the operations. We have an airline and we operate cargo aircraft today. And we are progressing towards making this operation autonomous. So it's uh, not just having um, the aircraft, having I mean, the operations and building the software to manage all of this so that progressively we can uh, take the pilots that are in the aircraft and move them to, to the ground and then have them operate a number of aircraft. So we are building like teleoperated vehicles. You probably have seen a lot of what is called EV tolls, large drones that can take off vertically and uh, land vertically, uh, but they, they present a lot of challenges. We take a very pragmatic approach and we want to leverage all of the infrastructure that already exists. So this is a map of all the airports in the US. For instance, we have over 5,000 of those. It's an infrastructure that exists uh, where we can take off and land for free every day. So why start from the roof that does not exist of a, of an, of, of a building? Let's start from the airport. And then, as Jan was saying, let's start like small steps, right? We do, we make the aircraft autonomous, really big step. But then once we have that, we can make it electric, we can bring passengers on board. So let's take one step at a time. 
So I'm going to talk first about the automation of the aircraft, and then we're going to talk about the, the cargo market. So the idea is to bring the pilots or the pilots uh, to the ground into a network operating center to have them connect to an aircraft, load a mission flight plan, like where do we go from plan A to plan B, and then have this operator solve some of the really difficult problems. We saw this morning that NLP uh, is making progress, but we still, you know, still ways to be able to use that reliably. The big question is, do we know, uh, does the automation or the robot not know what it doesn't know, right? Uh, in this case, air traffic control is a major challenge. So this is something we don't plan on solving. We plan on uh, having people on the ground talk on behalf of the aircraft and relay this information between air traffic control and the aircraft. So the aircraft is, we start from the Cessna caravan. So it's the workhorse of the industry. There are like over 2,000 of them around the world flying uh, all type of missions, either passenger or cargo. Uh, it's a simple aircraft relatively. So that's why we started with, uh, with this one. Uh, so you have like simple cables pulling all the flight control surfaces. And we are adding our system to manage the engine, to manage communication, to also do airborne and ground threat detections. Uh, that's, that's a key piece. We heard earlier about beyond visual line of sight flight. The only way to do that is to have a uh, way called detect and avoid system, a system that can detect any type of threat and safely route the aircraft around it. Uh, there are a few standards being developed for, for this, and we are actively working on one, uh, one of the systems. And of course, the system has to be fully redundant in case of uh, failure to be able to reconfigure and perform the mission. I have another video that is going to show how we do that in practice. So this Actually, shows... Control, test, radio check. Test, X-Wing Control, how do you loud and clear? Test, X-Wing Control, ready for engagement. Engagement. Oh. And, and three, two, one, X-Wing has control. X-Wing has control. X-Wing has control. X-Wing Control is ready for ground block. Elevator aft. Elevator forward. Check. Elevator neutral. Aileron coming left. Check. Extra control. Pre flight is complete. All systems are go. Ready to taxi. Roger. Excellent control. Ready to taxi. The ground. Excellent caravan. PSA. Ready to taxi. One left for takeoff with information mic. Excellent caravan. Conquer ground. Runway one left. Taxi via Gulf. One last main ramp to Gulf, X-Wing Caravan. Initiated. Projects not only to do the automation, but to see how you, inter you inter interact with other people. So in this case, it's about like having a smooth transition into the runway so that people don't wait for us. Uh, if your robot or your does not interact correctly with the, the surroundings, it's not going to get accepted. So how to have something that is uh, useful and that is not disruptive to, to other users is extremely important. Number two, follow Cessna left downwind, pass the number, runway one left, clear to land number two. Clear to land number two, one left, excellent caravan with traffic, follow in sight. 
So that's the same view for all of the uh, sensors behind the aircraft. Control the air shows traffic to follow to anybody. And allows actually the remote pilot to see a lot better on the, the surrounding traffic than uh, the path on board. In this case, the path on board like, took uh, a minute to be able to see the, the other uh, aircraft. Break test pass, all the screen, continue on to land. Hey, boss, go to land. On glide path. Once again, checking for health before uh, continuing to land. For the sake of time, I'm going to, to stop here, but like it taxis back and uh, comes to the end. Uh, the video is on YouTube if you want to watch to, uh, to the end. But basically, like at this point, we have a really good understanding of what it takes to integrate into the airspace. What do we have? So we have repeated this mission. In this case, we have 113 autonomous flights, 302 autolands. And by repeating that, that's when you understand like what you have to do. Like every time you go fly, air traffic control can ask you to do something different. So those are the type of things that we want to uh, to learn. And that we also learn by doing our part 135, so like our airline, where we get all the feedback and we collect that. So lots of miles flown. This is not as relevant as autonomous cars. Like you know, of miles, like we can go and fly for for days, and we, we have nothing to learn. What we learn is by pushing the boundaries and going to to fly into new, new places. Uh, but at the same time, every time we go fly, we look at all the events that happens, and we make sure that we can account for them or that we we improve our, our logic to be able to uh, to handle it. At this stage, we what you've seen is a prototype, and we are moving towards a certification system. The certificate. So this prototype has like five axes of custom autopilots. So that's the three axes plus throttle plus the, the braking. We can do gate to get missions like you've seen. Uh, we have our detector and avoid system that I'm going to talk just after that. that is coupled to the autopilot, so we can automatically reroute while in flight. Well, this chart is not updated, so it's more than 300 auto lens auto takeoff at this stage. Our longest flight is 840 miles, 4.2 hours. That shows that's a like, test to kind of push uh, the boundaries. This aircraft is able to go uh, 1,000 miles, so like 1,900 kilometers. So it's, we're not talking about like your beyond invasion line of sight. You, ha I mean, you have to go to be able to go really far. So that pushes us to realize like what kind of communication system do you need to be able to talk to the aircraft uh, throughout that, that journey? What latency do we have on this uh, satellite communication network? What kind of uh, communication do we need at the airport, destination airport, to be able to uh, integrate into a dense traffic? And we're able to, to do uh, remote operations so from the ground. And a lot of the path planning also is uh, we have to be, to be quick. It's not like we get authorization from the SRP control and we have to click and get that adjusted. So we have ways to translate uh, really quickly when SRP controls tells you like which sequence of taxiways to use that automatically generates a path that is uh, checked to be feasible. And if the aircraft as it taxis, detects and your object is going to, to stop and has to reroute. To give you, you know, the research community some, uh, some key uh, engineering challenges. So they're not necessarily like science to, primes to be solved, but more like challenges where um, it's the remaining 20% that we have to solve, the difficult 20%. Uh, so hazard avoidance. Uh, so when you're flying, be able to detect other airplanes uh, far away and to discern them from, you know, trucks on the ground is a very difficult challenge. That is, that's a place where there are still uh, not a complete solution. So if you guys into radars, that's a great place to uh, to go and spend some time. Uh, ground detect and avoid. When we do the, the flying, we're actually do, solving the self-flying, but also the self-driving problem. Uh, we have to drive on the airport. Uh, there are other cars. We have deers. We have like animals that can be on the runway. Uh, so we have to be able to detect and to avoid all of those, uh, those hazards. Certified navigation. GPS is great, but not good enough. Uh, so we need to have really precise positioning for, for taxiing. We need to be able to uh, follow the center line, and we don't always have a center line. So how do you make sure that you're not going to get out of the runway and hit your prop into uh, a sign on the side? 
ways to guarantee that if you do a GPS based open land, that you're not going to, that you're landing on the runway. Uh, you need to be able to detect an error in positioning from, uh, from the GPS with other sensors. And auto takeoff, it's pretty trivial most of the time, except if you lose heading, uh, then in that case, you might be out of the, the runway. So those are things where we don't have the FA or ES that doesn't have a certification basis. You don't have regulation that tell you exactly what to do to be able to certify it. Hazard avoidance, same thing, like there is no, uh, no regulation. Uh, flight controls, this is a solved problem. Now it's a time of making it affordable. Uh, you go to the Boeing, to the Airbus, they have highly reliable flight control system, but they're just way out of price for projects like, like ours. Um, so it, it's not going to be viable if we were to use one of their systems. And then communication. Uh, we need to be able to communicate with the aircraft over long distances. We need to have some uh, level of uh, reliability and guarantees on this uh, what is called like command and control link. Uh, this is an example that's like a year and a half old, but of our detect and avoid system. So in this case, we are fusing uh, four cameras. We also have ADSB. So in this case, we are flying with another, another aircraft, like head-on encounter. There's a vertical separation just for safety, right? So this is our another of our test pilots. And this is shows like measures in real time. If we get to this location, we're going to have to be too close. So the aircraft, in this case, we're using one of the sensors called ADSB. Then we're going to detect with the radar. In this case, it's going to replan as soon as we get close to the yellow. Um, and then we also have the cameras that are tracking this um, this aircraft. So we are fusing multiple sensors to uh, to validate one sensor against another. So in this case, um, you know the radar was a bit too short, and we didn't have like all the parameters. So tune right. So we sl slightly violated the uh, separation distance, and we are working on making that uh, better. So for the next time, I'll have a much better video for you guys. Perception on, on the ground. So now that we solved the prime in the air, we have to do the same thing on the ground. So we need to avoid, as I said, any types of obstacles. So in this case, we are using LIDARs, uh, which right now are probably the, the best sensor for this. So at the top uh, is the row, row uh, point cloud. At the bottom is when we, in this case, we're using voxels. Uh, and that's yeah, to my, the question I had yesterday, uh, to model ob uh, obstacles and to uh, to safely in this case, it's pretty easy. Like if we see something, we have to stop. So it's mostly about making sure there is not there is no undetected object, and that we safely stop when we have to. The nice thing about being in the uh, Silicon Valley is that we have autonomous or self-driving cars and engineers all, all over. So it's a great place to uh, to hire talent from. Developing drones takes a lot of manpower, lots of people to make one aircraft fly. If you from drones, usually it's a uh, 20 or 30 people to get one aircraft airborne. What we're doing is we're doing it with like optionally piloted aircraft. So we have a safety pilot in the left seat. So that allows us to fly kind of wherever we want almost. It allows us to uh, integrate into the airspace and have very few restrictions. Uh, so it's a really good crutch to, uh, to get started into experiment and to integrate uh, into, into that airspace. So we have a control station in the back of the aircraft. So we can set aside the the issues of a, of a command control link. So we have our engineers sitting in the back, uh, monitoring the system and, uh, you know, can input uh, as needed. And then on the right hand side, it's the uh, ground control station. So at the, you have the same uh, display as we have on the aircraft. Uh, we relay some of the video for the detect and avoid system. And then some of the other videos are more for uh, station awareness and are not required for, for operations. So we are, uh, the objective is to fuse all this information into a simple screen such that eventually that operator uh, doesn't need to get, can handle multiple aircraft. Uh, so it's, um, it's about providing the right information at the right time. Then what problem are we trying to solve? Going back to, uh, to Jan's question. <laughs> what problem are we trying to solve? And also like, why are we picking this problem? Eventually the market of regional transportation is huge. People want to travel long distances for for like a low price and a short uh, short time. So we're solving the uh, regional transportation problem, and we are tackling that you know by removing some of those uh, barriers to entry. So we we're starting to, like no passengers. Let's start with an aircraft that is known, that is uh, works really well, that is simple, and focus on the automation. Let's solve the automation problem first. 
And let's do that uh, for cargo. Lots of places around the world where the distance to go to some communities is really long. You have to drive and sometimes you have a body of water in between and you have to drive for like hundreds of kilometers because there's no bridge. If you fly, it's a five minutes or it can be an hour flight instead of an eight hour drive. We get emails regularly from people in Northern Canada where they have uh, cities that are uh, villages that are isolated and they don't get supplies because they, they don't have the pilots. They have an airport, they have an airplane, but they don't have a pilot. So there's a huge pilot shortage that actually COVID uh, enhanced. But lots of pilots retired. And now like it's really difficult for the small cargo aircraft to find pilots. And eventually, you know, you have network effect where if you have more assets and you don't have to deal with um, pairing them with a, with a flight crew, then you have more flexibility and you can reposition them more easily. How many times you've been to the airport and you've been waiting for a flight crew and your flight was delayed because the flight crew had, exp- had expired. Here, like we, we are reducing that problem where you can have people in one location managing a number of aircraft. And so one pilot can fly one aircraft into one time zone and then move to the next time zone and fly another aircraft and so on and so forth. So you really optimize for, for the people you have on the ground. And then we can have a more optimized way of flying those vehicles to reduce the, uh, the amount of fuel uh, being used. The first market we are tackling is the, the cargo market and the feeder cargo market. So UPS, FedEx, they fly large aligners into regional hub. And then this airline, the containers get uh, either on a truck if it's to go uh, close to your, to your house. Or uh, if you have to go a bit further away, they go into the small airplanes like the caravan, uh, fly 100 to 200 miles, and then get on on, on a van because uh, they guarantee that your package will be there before 10 a.m., right? So the only way to achieve that is to to do this last uh, 100 to 200 miles using small airplanes like this. Then why why do we operate? So we've decided to operate. So we own an airline. Uh, we fly every day for, for UPS. And some of the reason is that it's not just certifying the aircraft. It's also certifying the operations. It's those two things. And you have also certifying the, the pilots. Those things go hand in hand. If you have a great product, a uh, great aircraft, but nobody knows how to put down their airline certificate, it's not going to go anywhere. You're going to have to wait two, two more years. Uh, and then it's also like getting all the learnings from what you know an engineer in their lab will not be able to uh, to see so this is an example of uh, a feeder operation uh, in phoenix and you will see uh, it's an extreme it's on the ramp they, they've loaded most of the aircraft <laughs> So it's really hard to see, uh, and I'm sorry, uh, but you have like at least 15 of those aircraft. You have 50 people walking with the yellow vest, and you have the uh, the marshal like ushering the uh, the airplane, and you have three of them. So you have to feel like which one you have to track one after another. So that's things that you would never imagine if you haven't uh, witnessed it. You got people walking, you got like uh, props not spinning. It's, I'm surprised that not accident in those things. So you need to have an aircraft that can uh, safely maneuver uh, this environment. So the, the self-driving prime is not always that, that easy. And other places that, that are interesting, I'm just showing like how it's done. All the packages that you get, they, they're loaded one by one. And then somebody's playing Tetris and measuring like what is the CG and the mass of uh, all these packages. So that's another problem we have to solve. Right now, they have a pilot that may, that keeps track of what's happening. But if you remove that pilot, you still need to ensure that your center of gravity and your mass is within acceptable limits. So those are problems that we need to uh, to solve before we can uh, rely on, you know, we cannot rely on the people that uh, are loading the packages to do to do that, that job. Uh, they don't have the uh, know-how. They don't have the feeling of responsibility that it is like their life is not at stake, right? As a pilot, your life is at stake. So you take that very seriously. If you're not, if your life is not at stake, you don't t- take it as seriously. So we absolutely need to have ways to, uh, to ensure uh, that safety. So 
to conclude, flying is the easy part. Honestly, uh, the difficulty is to do it like safely, repeatedly, and in all conditions. So thinking about like all the uh, the corner cases, and that concludes my uh, my talk. Thank you. So I think we have some questions there. Thank you very much. Uh, I had a question on augmenting the system on the ground with um, maybe a rover on the landing site to check for the clearance of the landing or having a complementary system to check for the center of gravity. So are you thinking about expanding the plane into a robotic system that complements the missing parts? Yeah, I, mean, I think we need to have uh, ways to check for center of gravity automatically, for instance, or a way to make it much easier for the people loading the airplane to solve that problem. What we're trying to do also is limit how much more infrastructure we need. So we don't want to add, uh, you know, sensing system at the airport. We don't want to add more robots at the airport because the goal is to be able to eventually go on demand to random locations. So we don't want to be relying on something on, on the ground. So we have to be self-sustained. Uh, so yes, that's going to be like making the airplane like measure its center of gravity or its mass before taking off. Thank you for your presentation. So a few questions. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you chose the aircraft because it's simpler to start with. Mm -hmm. But what would you change in the next iteration to uh, enhance the performance? Also, it seemed the, the aircraft uh, flew in low altitude over residential area. So didn't you face any problems meeting the noise regulations with the FAA? And lastly, um, regarding the errors from the pilots, you, you mentioned that it's uh, the most uh, errors actually come from the pilots. Uh, but it seems that actually happened a few decades ago. L like recently, it seemed more from sensors or uh, like the Boeing in LA with the sensor and the landing gear. So doesn't it seem that uh, having someone in the aircraft would actually prevent any accident from, happen uh, from happening in any emergency? Thank you. All right, so few questions. I forgot the first one already, but I'm going to start with the second one since I remember it. All those airports, you know, I've been here for decades and we are flying just like any any other uh, aircraft around. So from the ground, there's no difference between what we do versus what, um, you know, other people are doing. And that's why we want to leverage all those airports. If they have, some of them have noise issues, uh, but we're not adding to that, right? But many of them are in places where there's, there's not much around or it's, it's accepted. So we follow like noise abatement procedures uh, and we are, you know, flexible with this. Uh, and that's why we're taking this approach of using this infrastructure. For the, your third question, which was about pilot errors, in the case of the Boeing, was uh, it's a safety issue where the fault tree was not analyzed properly. Uh, in this case, it's a matter of uh, designing your system to be fail operational. If you build a fault tree, very often at the bottom in your leaves, you're going to have uh, the pilot will recognize the failure and will take over, right? And that's why you have this manuals because the pilot has to recognize that failure. In the case of Boeing, the pilot, we're not trained to recognize the failure. So if from the get-go, you design your system to recognize all your fail all those failures, then you uh, you avoid that prime of relying on the, the pilot. Can you repeat your first question, please? Um, yeah. What would you change in the next iteration? Oh, next iteration. So... Once the autonomy prime is solved, I, I think it's going to be a matter of like looking at where we are in a couple of years also in terms of uh, market adoption. Are we ready for passengers? If we see that people are ready for passengers, then we may go into uh, you know trying to put people on board. If the electric market is uh, electric aviation is more ready, then it might be putting that onto electric airplanes. So there are a lot of options, and it's a matter of solving this prime first and then be ready for for what next. So we're looking at all the options, and so far nothing is a uh, quite decided. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting talk. Uh, I have a question about how do you deal with changes in uh, either the ground or flight environment as far as uh, a replanning of the path based on air traffic control instructions? Is it natural language processing that then generates a new path? That's How does that work? And the follow-up question to that is, was the ground or the air portion of that more difficult? So for the, for the uh, there is no NLP. It's not really for prime time uh, in, in aviation. Unfortunately, like a lot of the, the work that is being done here is way more advanced than what we do uh, because 
we are about solving the engineering prime, so like solving the remaining 20% and making whatever exists uh, super robust. Mm. So it's um, it's on the, currently it's on the ground where the uh, pilot is going to input and uh, translate what uh, ATC asked, and that's going to re- re- recalculate the trajectory. We are working on having both on the ground and in the air, so we want to have most of the software being the same in both places, so that eventually, um, if you lose the link, the aircraft can keep on doing what it's doing, and eventually, uh, most of the decision will be made by the aircraft and not by the ground. Okay, so if I'm understanding correctly, a human takes what the air traffic control is saying and inputs the flight, new flight plan or new program. Correct, okay. or modifies the uh, the current uh, flight plan. If you if you're given a heading, we're going to input this is your heading. And it's going to recalculate to always give you a closed path. It's not like you're going to go to heading and uh, be forgotten, right? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, we are out of time. But mashallah, your talk is like super inspiring. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for this. Thank you.